Good evening, friends, and welcome to Sleepy Time Tales, a sleep aid podcast aimed at helping you to get a restful night. Do you find your mind plagued with these stresses of modern life, especially when the lights are out and you're trying to get a restful sleep? Do you find your mind spinning and churning? Follow my voice down the path towards a restful night. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems, the ones that you can't solve right now, and that will be easier to solve with a solid night's rest anyway. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift, following the twists and turns, but slowly letting go and drifting into the deep night, the restful sleep. A mindset of focused relaxation rather than the spinning confusion many of us insomniacs face at night. Before we go any further tonight, I need to take care of some business. It's the sort of thing that usually happens at the end of most podcasts, but since I'm hoping you're asleep by the time we get that far, I need to mention the stuff right now. Firstly, you can find this podcast, all the episodes, as well as blog posts, musings, and some timeless production notes on our website, website rather, sleepytimetales.net. Comments, questions, suggestions can all be emailed to contact at sleepytimetales.net. You can find links to all of our relevant social media on the website, but you can go straight from here to our Twitter, which is at sleepytimetales and Facebook, which is at Sleepy Time Tales Podcast. Um, I have been getting some rather nice feedback, not a lot, but it's starting to come in, and um, I appreciate everything that I hear from people. It's nice to know that people are being helped. Um, Yeah, this podcast is definitely not for everybody, so if you're somebody that I reach, uh, let me know. It feels good to know that we're helping out. Uh, It's also nice to see, looking through some of my stats, that I've got a few subscribers, which, uh, while listeners is nice, people who actually subscribe, who want to hear what you have to say, I just want to give a shout out to you folks, you are extra special. So, uh, thank you for the support, thank you for the kind words, and thank you for your subscriptions already. Um, They're all much appreciated. Um, We also have a channel on YouTube where I will be putting up simple visualized enhanced versions of the episodes for enjoyment. Some people like um, to leave the YouTube playing in the background and uh, flashing lights may help a little bit. Uh, You can search for Sleepy Time Tales podcast there or follow the link in the show notes. Also in the show notes and on the website is a link to the podcast newsletter. If you're interested in hearing up-to-date info and news and um, I'm not too sure what else, maybe maybe specials or products that I think may help people get a sleep for a restful night, um, subscribe and I'll promise not to spam you. I'll only send stuff out that I think is genuinely interesting. Now, if you're enjoying the show and or finding it useful, if it's helping you a couple of nights a week, or if you're like me and you leave your sleep aid podcast running in the background so the droning voices can sing you to sleep, uh, it would be much appreciated if you could give me a little bit of support to help some of the costs. Um, I was going to hold off a few months on starting a Patreon because I wanted to have a body of work to justify it first. But Patreon recently announced some changes that will make it more expensive and less useful for new creators starting campaigns after May 2019. So I figured I'd just hold my nose and jump in and get started. So if you're interested, it's there. Um, If it reaches a stage where there's enough for it to be compelling, it's there for your for whenever you're ready, but no pressure. But um, the show is free. So what reason could you have to actually pay me for it? There are a couple of reasons. Firstly, maybe you'd just like to. It's a service I provide, mainly to help people, and if you think that it's something you'd like to support and you're finding it useful, that may be reason enough for you. But if you'd like to get a bit of a sweetener, I do have some rewards levels available on the Patreon. There are three at the moment, I'm keeping things quite simple. If you can afford a dollar a month, I will genuinely appreciate that. I live in a country where a dollar is actually a usable amount of money. So if you want to back me at a dollar a month, I will, with your permission, list your name or alias on a thank you page on the Sleepy Time Tales website, sleepytimetales.net. 
Now, while a single dollar is genuinely a usable amount of money, uh, add four more to make five, and we have a very useful amount of money. To thank you for reaching that deeply, I'll provide you with an RSS feed of episodes that don't have this whole down to business section in it, where I'm rattling a can asking you for money. Also, while I don't have any advertising on the show, if that ever changes, any $5 and up patrons will receive, will receive ad-free episodes in their custom feed. If you really love what I do and can kick $10 a month in my direction, you will really get one extra episode every month. I'll do a full movie recap review that will be chosen in a poll by users. Um, if I can come up with anything else that is uh, worthwhile for higher level Patreons, I will. But right now, $10 is the cap. You can find the Patreon at patreon.com slash sleepytimetales or patreon.sleepytimetales.net. Um, if a monthly commitment is a bit too much for you, which is also understandable, I do have a tip jar up on my website where you can throw a bit of spare change my way whenever you're so inclined. And again, I'll repeat myself, literally a single dollar is useful. If that is what you can afford and you feel it isn't going to help, be assured it will, and it will be appreciated. Another way you can help without costing yourself anything extra is checking out the affiliate links on many episodes and on the website. A link to items that are related to the theme of an episode in the show description, and the website has links to sleep aid podcasts, appliances, and even some very nice looking beds. So take a look if you're on the market. Uh, another way you can help without actually costing yourself any money is rate and review the podcast on whatever your service of choice is. The show can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify. Um, I was using SoundCloud, but I ran out of space on the free service. So I think I'm going to cut that until I start making, until I can co- cover a subscription on that. But of course, uh, if you found it, you already know where to find it. A five-star review will get the show in front of more people, and the more people who find it, the more people have a chance of helping find a good night's sleep. Also, any interesting or funny reviews that I get, I will read out at the end of an episode. So, and also, if this helps, help, if this show helps you find a good night's sleep, it may help others. So, other than reviews, also please share the show on your social media, or to any friends or family you think it may help. Even if it doesn't help you, it may help somebody else, because everyone who suffers sleepless nights is usually open to options. Even if it doesn't necessarily work for one person, it may work for someone else. The music in this episode, and all episodes thus far, is Un Désert Bakuniku. Their music is available on the Free Music Archive. I've linked their website and their Patreon in the show notes, as there's some very cool stuff released under various different names. That I definitely would recommend checking out, especially if you need music for media of your own. Um, that's enough of business, now back to the fun part. So what exactly is Sleepy Time Tales, and what is a sleep aid podcast? To answer your question, let me start with a common problem. Do you find yourself lying awake at night, mind spinning and emotions in turmoil with the anxieties of 21st century life? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and find yourself self, find yourself not quite able to doze back off at 3am? I'm here to help. My name is Dave and I'm your narrator, here to talk you into a restful night. I'm someone who has struggled to sleep ever since I was a baby. My parents had sleepless nights with me for many years, and even once I got old enough not to bother them, I struggled to sleep a lot. I discovered far too late in life that droning male voices have a tendency to put me into a deep sleep. I learned this when listening to podcasts at bedtime or even during the day when I was at home because I was doing shift work. Eventually I found out that sleep podcasts are a thing. There are quite a lot that read old stories out, and there are some for adults and many for children. I found one that was quite special though. It was specifically designed for the purpose of distracting the restless mind. It's a show that's been around for a while called Sleep With Me. It worked very well for me, but when I recommended it to others, they didn't like the narrator's voice. There wasn't anything else quite like it that I could find, so I wondered if I could make an alternative with my own droning voice. And here it is. 
This intro will go on for a few minutes as I explain the idea behind the behind the podcast and why I think that listening to me will help you. Then, after the intro, the story will begin. Before the story the story starts, maybe try to wind down and grab a glass of water, turn out the lights, and prepare yourself for the experience of sleeping as we prepare to go on a journey together to a restful night's sleep. Or maybe it's not a journey. Maybe it's more like we're building a space for you, a mental nest to settle into. The idea is that you listen to me closely as I tell you tonight's story. That you listen and stop the spinning mind that prevents you, like me, many nights from having a restful night's sleep. The story I will tell is going to be kind of boring and pointless, and the plan is that it engages your attention just enough to stop your mind from spinning into overdrive, as as happens to us insomniacs at bedtime. It's important, though, not to force it. You must allow the process to happen naturally. Just keep a light mental grip on the thread of my voice and allow the natural need to sleep to slowly wind you down. I'm hoping that you're asleep before I get to the end of the episode, but don't feel pressurized. It may not work on the first night, if this is your first night. Maybe it will take a few nights for you to get used to listening to my voice. Maybe my accent is strange to you. Maybe one episode just isn't long enough. There are as many different types of sleeplessness as there are types of sleepless people, in my opinion. It is very important, though, that you try to relax. If you're new to the show and prone to late nights, lying, staring at the ceiling, it may take a while, even a few days, for this to work for you. So listen to the sound of my voice as I tell you a tale. You probably realized already that tonight's episode is a recap of Twin Peaks. It's the second episode, the first one after the pilot. Um, It's an episode that doesn't have much nasty stuff in it, but what little is there I've kind of left out because I don't want to give you any nightmares or keep you out at bedtime. After a few weeks of experimentation, I've settled into something of a routine and plan with episodes. I'm going to mix it up between original, mostly improvised stories, TV episode recaps, which at the moment, as I've mentioned, are Twin Peaks, and recountings of uh, events from mythology. Unfortunately, my attempt at doing two episodes a week has been a bit ambitious, and as I wasn't getting enough sleep myself, because I was always up late editing. So I'm going back to an episode a week for a while, but I may have a few extras every now and then. Subscribe on your podcast service of choice to keep in the loop and you'll have everything fresh as soon as it comes out. Also, if you, the listener, find some things work better than others, feel free to let me know through social media or the email I provided earlier. So queue up a few episodes or just run through the backlog. What I do with Sleep Aid podcasts is I just let them stream all night. I lie down in the dark with earbuds in and just let them run. Sometimes when I wake up at 3am, the stream is still running and I let the voices waft me back to sleep. Sometimes I wake up 30 minutes before my alarm goes. Usually I just carry on listening and it knocks me right back out. Let me tell you now that that 30 minutes is often the most restful part of my night. There's something about allowing yourself to relax completely right before the alarm that just really satisfies on a deep level. So you have the basic idea. You relax and you lie in the dark. And while you do that, I tell you a tale. It may be a story I make up, it may be me talking about a movie or TV show, like tonight's. So relax. Relax, dear listener, my lifetime, my nighttime friend who is elected to lie in the dark listening to my voice. Thinking about it, that does sound a bit strange, doesn't it? You're inviting me, a stranger from somewhere in the world, probably far away, to speak to you in your sleep. To speak you to sleep. But you'll always be safe with me. I'm here to help you relax. To improve your life in a small way. Or maybe not so small. People don't sleep very well these days. And it makes their lives harder. So I'm here to do my small part. To help you in a big way. To help you face tomorrow. And the day after. Well rested and better able to cope and process. I'm going to tell mostly feel good stories. Maybe a few mysteries. I mean, tonight is Twin Peaks, but I'll focus on the weird, confusing stuff rather than the sad and depressing stuff. 
I'm also not going to focus on any of the bad parts of modern life that keep us awake. I will only share stories that relax or make your life better, even in small ways. I believe very strongly in the benefits of kindness. I want to be kind to you. I want to share kindness with you. And I want you to be kind to yourself. Don't beat yourself up or rebuke yourself over not sleeping. Don't get tense if you just can't get yourself over the edge of sleep, even with me here in your ears trying to help. Frustration is one of the greatest enemies of a good night's sleep. The intention with this podcast is to short-circuit that frustration, to distract the feeling we get when we start to blame ourselves for not being able to let go and drift into the dark. Take a deep breath and forget the fact you can't sleep, and let my voice wash over and under you. Take another breath and imagine the warm darkness rising up, inviting you to sleep into a better life starting tomorrow. And if you can't let go, forgive yourself and try again tomorrow. If you've had a life of insomnia, sleep is something like an enemy. But it is not your enemy. It's a natural process that we have been pulled away from by stress and life and the supposed progress that shines bright lights in our eyes at all hours. I'm here to work with you. To create a safe space. A cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So, if you're still with me, thank you for staying. If you're already asleep, you can't hear me, but we'll chat again soon. And let your dreams be about the story that I'm about to tell you now. Twin Peaks Episode 2 Traces to Norway. Thanks for joining me again as I continue my journey in trying to finally watch Twin Peaks after nearly 30 years of me- meaning to get to it. Uh, we return, we pick up on episode 2, after the, the first episode after the pilot obviously. We start out with a previously on section where they make a special point to mentioning the name of Harry S. Truman, the sheriff of Twin Peaks. They seem very in love with the clever name that they came up with this poor guy. So we go, we have the previously on, we see what happened in the previous episode, we see once again the very rustic and quite beautiful looking area around Twin Peaks, which again I meant to actually look up and see where it was, but for now I'm going with like Seattle, well, Washington State or something like that is my assumption, something in the Pacific Northwest, as I know it's near Canada. Okay, so we have our beautiful intro, we have the gorgeous music, which is quite dated, but still quite stunning. And we open with a very long pan and tilts around a uh, very rustic hotel room. It seems like it was um, designed by somebody trying to make it look as uh, foresty and and, um, uh, sort of touristy as possible, because it there's stuffed animals and stuffed fish and hunting prints and all sorts of really cliched things. We are hearing um, a secret, uh, not secret agent, he's not a secret agent, FBI agent Dale Cooper is once again on his dictaphone talking to Diane, giving a very detailed assessment of his um, impressions of the hotel room, very comfortable bed, warm shower, good pressure, and we slowly pan over to him where we see he's hanging upside down by his ankles. First time I ever saw something like that was I think the first, oh not first Batman movie, but the 1989 Batman movie with Michael Keaton. So that sort of thing always makes me think of the, uh, you know, someone trying to be Batman. We then go, we open on the dining room at the hotel where a waitress is pouring Cooper his coffee where he rates the coffee extremely high. It's one of the, according to him, it's one of the best cups he's ever had. He gives a very detailed order. He seems to like extremely well-cooked food. He likes hard eggs, crispy bacon, and all sorts of stuff that sounds kind of gross, to be honest. We have Audrey Horn coming into the room. You remember Audrey from the last episode. Her father is the owner of the hotel. Uh, she's a, the, well, her father's one of the, the rich guys in town. She doesn't seem to get on very well with Donna and her friends. 
as I recall, and she was the one who snuck out of the house and put on bright red shoes because apparently Dad wouldn't approve of that sort of thing. Anyway, she's checking out Dale Cooper, and he catches her eye, and she comes up to ask if she can join him. He mentions that she, he knows who she is, that his, her, his, he knows that her father owns the hotel, and he says that she's welcome to join him. I'm trying to see here, oh yeah, she, Audrey mentions to Dale that um, Laura Palmer was the tutor for her bro brother Johnny, who despite being 27 is still in the third grade, so he seems to have, uh, in her words, he has emotional problems which run in the family. So he seems to be a bit developmentally challenged, poor kid, we saw him in the previous episode wearing a wool bonnet hitting his head on a model of the hotel. She shows Dale her ring and she gets, uh, in her words, flushed. She's uh, completely flirting with him, this naughty girl. Dale, we cut to the police station where Dale Cooper arrives. Lucy is in the front eating a donut in front of a pile of pink donut boxes. And um, Dale walks in on Harry, who's also eating a donut. He's completely jammed his mouth full and can barely chew, chew effectively, while Dale um, basically goes on at him, monologuing. Then we cut to the nice doctor, Donna's father, the coroner. He is talking to uh, Dale and Harry, where he says he couldn't, he couldn't do the post-mortem. He couldn't, he couldn't bear to do it. So he got somebody from a nearby town to do it, and he assisted. We find out that Laura had relations with the three men in the 12 hours before her death. And so, yeah, this town is full of naughty girls who are up to things that her, their families would not approve of. And we cut to Leo and Shelley's house. Remember, Leo is the apparently violent trucker married to Shelley, the young waitress from the diner who is having a fling with Bobby, Laura's boyfriend. The people in this town really just can't behave themselves. They're actually, mm, well, I guess it's small towns. Shelley comes out to the truck where Leo is fiddling around doing some cleaning. He, she's about to get picked up for work and Leo chucks his jacket at her because she didn't wash it. This, you know, he was upset that she didn't wash his jacket that he had hidden in his truck. Um, Leo is thoroughly unlockable. I wouldn't be upset if something happens to him at some stage. Treats his wife like absolute garbage and seems like a rather dangerous person. Shelley takes his jacket and there's another shirt wrapped in it, which she discovers is, wrapped, is covered in blood. She's not too sure what to do, but she stashes it somewhere. I was making notes and I didn't actually see what she did with it, but I'm sure it was around somewhere, as we will discover later. Leo tells Shelley that he will come to the diner and says she must keep a slice apart for him and pinches her on the cheek. It looks like a cute gesture at first and then starts to look quite painful. Cut once again to the police station where we have Dale and Harry interrogating James the Barker boy. They show him the video, which he admits that he made at the time. It was a, uh, about two weeks earlier, if I recall. I didn't write that part down. James said that he was proud of the relationship, but Laura wanted to keep it a secret. She had, had a history of using cocaine, but James got it to stop. But something had happened recently and she'd started again. She wouldn't share why something had really upset her. James said that he saw her that the night she died, where she snuck out at around 9pm, and uh, she left him in the dark in the forest, as I recall, sometime at 12.30, and he didn't follow her or try to be to her because she was very upset, and he left her to it, and he really regretted that. She said that she couldn't see him anymore, and she just wouldn't say why. Dale and Harry... Opening Laura's diary, asked what happened on February the 5th. James doesn't answer, but he there's a flashback to him and Laura where she splits the heart in half, the one that he had buried earlier. So she splits the heart, gives half to James, and then with this flashback ends, and James says he doesn't know where the other half of the heart is. 
Bobby and Mark are still in jail, as, as you may recall from the previous episode. They are alone now, so they're talking about... Um, uh, they mention Leo, so they've also got uh, something going on with him. They mention Mark asked about the money, which Bobby said he'd given half to Leo already. Um, they start getting rather, rather loud and rowdy with each other about, because apparently Bobby wasn't supposed to give any money to Leo, and they were supposed to give it all the same time that day. Bobby tells Mark that the other half of the money was in Laura's safe deposit box. Now we know already from the previous episode that the safe deposit box was opened by Harry and, and Dale and they've got the money. Mark is very concerned about this fact that they don't have the money that they're going to owe to Leo. We don't know Leo very well but I'm getting a feeling that we know exactly why they're so scared of him. We go back to the video again and then just as in like a sort of interlude. And then we cut to Donna and and her mom at their home. Donna has overslept. The mother and father, the, the doctor decided to let her sleep in. She was supposed to go to the sheriff's office, but the sheriff's office had phoned and said that she could come in the next day. Donna's mother tells her that she'd been crying in her sleep, but Donna didn't remember any of that. She does remember something that was a mix of a dream and a nightmare. Donna tells her mother about the relationship that Laura had with uh, with uh, James. And she believes at this point that she and James are the ones who are actually really in love with her and they belong together and she feels guilty about the fact that um, she essentially waited for Laura to die before she moved in on her man. We go once again to Harry and Dale at the police station. We find out that Ed from the gas station, the mechanic, is James's uncle. James, James is, he is told that James is not a suspect. So they will be releasing James into Ed's custody. Dale receives a call from someone called Albert Rosenfeld, which he goes to take. Ed and Harry speak. Ed says he feels like he was drugged before he got into the fight where he got hit because he didn't even remember the fight itself happening and he was feeling really drowsy. They mention one of the bartenders as a suspect for doing that. We find out from Dale's side of the telephone conversation that Albert is coming. Dale tells him that there's a cherry pie that will make him want to die. Um, yeah. That's pretty much that. And so we know somebody from the FBI called Elbert is coming. And Dale is recommending Cherry Pie to him. That's pretty much all we know at this point. Ed's wife Nadine, the lady with the one eye, bumps into Norma, the diner waitress that Ed was on the date with at the roadhouse the night before, at a hardware store. She, she, I don't know what it is about uh, Nadine and these drapes. She's very smug about her new drapes. She seems to have a little bit of hostility towards Nadine, so maybe she suspects something's going on there. But she makes sure that Nadine knows that Ed was very helpful when it came to putting the drapes up. Nadine says she's invented new silent drape runners, which is going to be made from cotton balls. Which, while that seems like it might effective, doesn't seem particularly hard wearing. So I don't know if that's the best of ideas, but I'm not going to argue with Nadine. She seems like a thoroughly unlikable person who will pick a fight just for the fun of it. Dale and Harry tell Mark, tell James that Mark and Bobby are about to be released and that he needs to be care, be take care of himself. Ed tells James that he has already organised protection for him because Mark and Bobby will be coming after him. Dale also warns Mark and Bobby that if anything happens to James, they're going to know exactly who to look at. There's a very weird bit here that I took a second to understand because I have the worst handwriting. Harry says to Dale that he feels like he should get a medical degree because he feels like his surname should be Dr. Watson, or his name should be Dr. Watson. We then cut to Josie, Josie Packard, who comes to Pete, who found Laura's body, and says on top of the morning to him. Pete very kindly says, no, the saying is top of the morning. Josie's English seems rather impeccable, except every now and then the little things slip. Um, 
Josie, thanks Pete for supporting her, for giving her support with the dispute with Catherine previously when they were fighting over whether to close the sawmill or not. And we have Harry and Dale arrive to speak to Josie because we found out that Laura seems to have been tutoring the whole town and was helping Josie with her English. Josie offers them coffee. She and Pete come out. Pete's holding a big can of coffee that looks like something that should be got on a campfire. Quite an impressive um, size piece of co- size piece of equipment for making coffee. They he pours them the coffee. They talk for a little while. We find out that Laura was tutoring Jesse, uh, Josie in English. Josie was very uh, Laura was very bothered on the last day. Uh, she got a lesson from her on the last, the last day she was alive, and she seemed very bothered. She mentions something that I think I understand how you feel about your husband's death, which is quite a strange thing for a 17-year-old girl to say to a widow. Josie goes out because the phone has rung. A lot of phone calls in this show. It's something that you don't seem to get so much in TV shows, people leaving the room to take a call. Well, I suppose they do still, except these days it's cell phones. Dale asks Harry how long his and Josie's relationship went on because it's um, very obvious to him, although Harry was trying to keep it quiet. We found out that Harry's wife passed away about a year and a half ago. Pete comes running out, says, don't drink the coffee, there's a fish in the percolator. Uh, That's quite strange why there would be a fish in the percolator. Yeah. It's a very large percolator, so it could have been a good size fish too. Very strange. This is a very strange show. I'm sure this is not the last time I'm going to say that. We see Josie and Catherine on the phone with each other. Catherine is being her usual miserable self. She's saying how much they lost $87,000 from the closing the sawmill for the day. And when she calls the decision to close the sawmill shenanigans. She's drinking a glass of wine with someone off camera, though. Josie goes, and we see that Josie and Ben, Ben, uh, gone, ben Horn, I went blank on his surname, the owner of the hotel, uh, have been busy getting down with each other. It doesn't seem like a very loving relationship. They're snapping at each other constantly. And they mention a plan, and then... Ben starts kissing uh, Catherine's feet, and they start getting down again. I don't get this whole foot thing. It's a bit of a mystery to me. Uh, Yeah, no, gross. Anyway, I don't judge people who like like feet, but not for me. We're somewhere we haven't been in a while, and someone we haven't seen a while uh, is Laura Palmer's father, uh, Leland. He's talking, he's coming, he's talking to... Or his mother. I need to look up her name because I don't think she's ever like mentioned by name. Or if she is, I don't catch it. Uh, Donna has come to visit. Don, Laura's mother obviously says how much she's missing her, holding on to Donna's hand. She suddenly starts screeching. I'm sorry. This this performance of Laura's mother is just like really really annoying. It's the hardest thing in the entire show to deal with. She starts screeching and clinging onto Donna as though she thinks that Donna is Laura. It's a bit strange. She glances over Donna's shoulder while she's holding onto her and she sees a long-haired man in the corner behind the arm of the couch and she starts uh, screeching again. She screeches a lot. Okay, then we go to the hospital where Renetta Polanski's parents are outside her hotel room. They, the deputy, deputy sheriff, who's a native looking man, see, is busy interviewing them, and he sees a man in a red suit, which, um, attracts his attention, so he follows him, but the man in the red suit disappears. We go again to the hotel where Audrey Horn is, uh, I suppose you could call it dancing. She's standing in one place, sort of swaying in time to lightweight jazzy music going in the background. Her father barges in, turns off the music, says something along the lines, I told you to stop disturbing the guests with this with this stuff. Ben finds out that Audrey gone in to see the Norwegians right before they all ran out of the hotel and left without saying why. 
she says that she went into the into the banquet hall to have a look at the smorgasbord and happened just calmly happened to mention about her poor murdered friend that she was so upset about. Ben Horn mentions something along the lines of Leland lost his fa- his daughter yesterday, I lost you years ago. So obviously they've got a bit of a strange relationship. Don't know what the uh, what the uh, root of that is, but I get the feeling we're going to find out. We go to Bobby and his parents sitting down for dinner. Bobby's dad is uh, a military man, as I mentioned previously, I think, his father. Uh, I can't remember the actor's name, but he's quite famous from Stargate for playing General Hammond. So it was quite uh, charring to see him in this for me. They say grace, and Bobby's father's going on talking to Bobby, saying he's trying to respect his rebellion because it's part of the process of growing up. But some more destructive behaviours need to be addressed. Bobby goes to light his cigarette, and his dad hits him in the face. The cigarette shoots out and lands in his mother's food, which is... I don't even know what it is. I think it's a meatloaf, but the cigarette goes right into it like it's really soft. It looks, frankly, disgusting and dry. Um, The mother pulls the cigarette out, looks at it, uh, but nonplussed, and says to Bobby that we're here for you. Which I guess is nice of a parent if you'll think your son may be a killer and he's a douchebag but anyway we are with dale and harry again this time they're at the diner log lady is there and we find out in the conversation that dale and harry are having with the waitress norma that laura helped her out with her meals and wheels program dale tries some of the cherry pie which he loves so much he orders two more slices Dale seems to like the finer things in life, despite his fondness for overcooked eggs and bacon. But he's not shy to enjoy himself, and you know something? I respect that. Log Lady tells Dale that her log will have something to say, because it saw something that night. Dale asks the lady what the log saw. She says, ask the log. Dale can't bring himself to speak to the log though, so Log Lady says, I thought so, and storms out. Shelley walks into the house where we see Leo slicing up a football. Um, so Leo, well, we already know Leo's up to something with Bobby and Mike, so the football must have something to do with it. Uh, I have watched ahead, I admit, but even without that context, uh, we know that it looks like something to do with smuggling. Leo tells... Um, tells Shelley he's going to teach her a lesson because she lost his shirt which was the one covered in blood that we saw earlier he realized he'd given it to her he searched for it couldn't find it so this is now we find out this is the second time she has lost a shirt that he likes a lot and he's going to teach her a lesson we have a hard cut to Donna's house where Donna is introducing her family to James she's decided to invite him around the house for dinner Doc says he doesn't really know James's family, so we find out, so Doc obviously knows most of the families in town, but James mentions that his mother's out of town a lot, uh, she travels. They, Donna and James take a second to say that they will talk after dinner. We then cut to the outside of Donna's house where Mike and Bobby pull up in Mark's, in Bobby's car. Obviously, they're planning on something. They're not liking the fact that James is moving in on uh, Mark's girl after James had already moved in on Bobby's girl. Then we go to the weird doctor, whose name I don't recall right now. He's listening to a tape of Laura. I can't remember if we established in the previous episode that he was a psychiatrist, but we now know for sure that he is Laura's psychiatrist. Which, if you'll recall, her parents didn't know she was seeing. He lies down, listening to the tape. She mentions that she mentions something about James that he's very sweet but very dumb, and she can't actually be around him anymore. The crazy doctor, a strange doctor, rather. I don't like to throw around ableist slurs if I can avoid it. Sorry about that. He is holding the missing half a heart, which we saw was picked up, which Laura's mother saw in a vision at the end of the, at the pilot episode. 
for some reason he's keeping it in a coconut which is quite strange but then his whole house is done with tropical style decor so it seems to be a theme so I guess the coconut as a jewelry box or bric-a-brac storage makes sense and when as I mentioned in the previous episode we've got very emotionally expressive people in this town the doctor's listening to Laura's voice looking at the heart and he starts crying and then we cut to credits Thanks for joining me on this episode of the Sleepy Time Tales podcast. The Sleep Aid podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you get a restful night. New episodes will be released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week. But make sure to subscribe in whatever service you use so that you get the new episodes and maybe the odd bonus whenever they come out. A reminder that the music for tonight is Un Desire by Kumiko. Check out more of their work on their website and their Patreon, which you'll find links in the show notes. Good night and sweet dreams.